Thank you all so much for being with us today, tonight. Um, it's a beautiful day, so we appreciate you taking some time to come back to your computer screens. We are lucky enough tonight to be joined by Matthew Peterson to talk about some conservatory hidden gems. And Matthew comes to us from Colorado. Uh, he attended the University of Denver and graduated with a degree in biology and minors in chemistry and leadership studies. After completing his education, he came out to Longwood Gardens as a conservatory intern. And then over five years, he served as senior horticulturist, overseeing the orangerie and the exhibition hall. And while there, he saw the development of volunteer training and accountability program that has been implemented in several areas of the conservatory. He spent time training in other areas of the garden, including our idea garden, the brick walk and various production teams. And then this past January, he transitioned to serving as the manager of the West Conservatory. So we're really pleased to have Matthew here. Um, as we go through this garden chat, it's a little bit of a different format than we have done in the past. Um, and this is because we're still virtual, um, but we wanted you to be able to really see uh, the different um, highlights and gems that Matthew's talking about. So we are going to show you some clips that have been pre-filmed uh, by Matt. Um, and then after each clip, we're actually gonna stop and we'll have time for Q&A and Matt will talk a little bit more about uh, each of these gems. So we'll go through them. There will be time at the very end for Q&A, um, but you're also welcome at any point to um, unmute yourself and, and ask your question that way. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Matt to have any introductions he would like to do for himself. Matt. Oh well, yeah. Hello everybody. My name's Matt, as she said before, and I'm super excited about this topic, um, the hidden gems of the conservatory. There's so much here. And every time I walk through it, I'm still finding little surprises and things that fascinate me. And in fact, I thought it would only be fitting to sit in another hidden gem to do this presentation with you all tonight. So. If you haven't explored the children's garden as thoroughly as you should, which I would really recommend everybody do that. There's tons of hidden gems here. But behind me is the beautiful stained glass that is found within the children's garden. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is, because I'm hoping on your next visit, you'll come find it yourself. But I just, I, I felt like it was only necessary to even incorporate one more hidden gem. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> awesome. OK, so we are going to get started. We're going to jump right into it. Um, the first clip is, let me get it going, and let me play for you. So one of my favorite plants in the East Conservatory is this philodendron golden xanadu. Um, we really like to highlight it in this pot. It's one of our unique specimen, and it's really known for this beautiful chartreuse green foliage. And as it ex is exposed to the right amount of light, that color just continues to grow and grow in its brightness. Now there is a more readily available one on the market called Philodendron Xanadu. However, it has a really deep dark forest green foliage and you'll find it everywhere, but it's really not gonna have this stunning dramatic light show that you get with the Philodendron Golden Xanadu. The only problem is you really won't find this plant anywhere on the market anymore. Longwood acquired this plant eight or nine years ago when it came out on the market. And unfortunately, we must have been some of the only people interested in this plant because it just did not sell well. And horticulture is very much market driven. So when this plant did not sell well, the breeders and producers quit producing it. Now in the United States, there are very strict patent laws that protect plants like this. So while the breeder quit producing it, nobody else can either. And that usually lasts for at least 20 years. So while this plant came out eight or nine years ago, there's at least 10 more years protecting this plant from anybody else propagating it. So in nature, we talk about maintaining biodiversity or protecting these rare and extinct species. The same can happen in horticulture for us. There are unique cultivars and specimens such as this golden xanadu that you can't find on the market anymore. And unfortunately, we can't even propagate it and reproduce it ourselves. So I think that's why this really merits being considered one of the hidden gems in the conservatory, because while it's not a rare plant in terms of biodiversity, it's rare in the fact that you just won't find it on the market. And we're super lucky that we have one of the largest specimens I've ever seen right here at the front doors of the East Conservatory. All right. Matt. Let's just say I definitely wish I had this on my calendar as to when this would be available again, because it is truly that spectacular. And, you know, these patent laws are very unique and that this plant is protected. And 
I, I'm sure you've all seen it as you walked in that front door, but I just, I wanted to give a little story and a little context to what you're seeing as you walk in the door. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments about this plant. You're welcome to put them in the chat or just unmute yourselves. Either way works for me. We can, we can look at both. All right, Which shall we I move on I to the next it one? All. Yep. <laughs> all right, here we go. So yeah, so right now we're currently standing in the Court of Palms. And if the name isn't indicative enough, you can look around and see above us and all around us, there are beautiful palms all around this space. Now the designer wanted it to read very strongly as the Court of Palms. And there's a little trick to seeing that that most people miss out on. And actually, if you look down near my feet here, you'll see inlaid in the stone are artistic renditions of palm fronds himself. So the goal was on a cloudy day, at the nighttime, whenever it may be that somebody is strolling through the Court of Palms, we want that illusion to still exist. We want you to feel like you're walking through an area and the canopy of the palm fronds is overhead and the shadows are underneath. So on this floor, you'll find these beautifully artistic inlaid palm fronds. And I also invite you to realize that that exists in one other spot in the conservatory as well. And it's actually across the way in the Court of Bamboo. So the next time you're here visiting, I'd highly recommend you step into that Court of Bamboo for just a few minutes and enjoy the large bamboo stalks that are shown on the floor there as well artistically. One of the more subtle features you'll find adjacent to the Court of Palms is this beautiful blue fountain behind me. This is actually made of Brazilian blue granite, and there's really only one quarry in the world where this granite is even available. And last I was aware, there's actually no more granite being pulled from such a mine. So what you see right there is a super rare piece of material. We actually hand designed it here at Longwood Gardens, and then we had it computer cut for us. What you can't see is the seam. This is actually two separate pieces of stone fused together perfectly by our masons here at Longwood Gardens. So you really don't see that there's two pieces together. On top of it's a beautiful custom-made bronze florette fountain piece. Now, when we put this into this portion of the garden, you'll notice that we were very intentional with our planting as well. The, the beautiful blue granite is stunning, but we wanted it to meld with the garden and not contrast. So you'll see we were very, very selective with the plant choices we made. And in fact, the designer himself chose the giant cycad in the back there, the encephalardus, to kind of imitate the shape and design of the fountain with plant material as well. Definitely a fun space. Um, one of my favorites, actually, the Court of Palms. It's one that we've changed recently, I'd say, in the last year or two. And you'll see that we really tried to take that calming blue color and carry it throughout the rest of the space. So next time you're here, you'll notice that either the fern that you see up front or the palms around it we actually look for that metallic blue color or that soft gray so that the fountain really just kind of melds seamlessly with the space. I don't know if there's any questions about this space or the palms around it or any other questions you have about the area in general. All right, we're gonna keep going. Yes. Take it as a good sign. Oh, so right now we're currently standing. Hold on, should so, I say? We'll pause that real quick. There, there I we think go. there's a question. Oh, yeah, when, so did when did we acquire, we acquire it? Yes. Yeah, so this was actually acquired when the um, the we, the East Conservatory was redone its most recent time. So the East Conservatory has actually kind of been overhauled twice in its history. Originally, it was a camellia house under Mr. Dupont, and they redid it in the 70s. And the roof they put on in the 70s just didn't quite cut it. It was causing major leakage issues and design issues as well. So in the early 2000s, I believe we redid the entire East Conservatory. Oh and it's at that time that we acquired the stone and it was put in with the initial opening of the East Conservatory that last time it was redesigned. Great question. You're all gonna put me on the spot for sure today. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, we're gonna move on to the next one. Yeah, so these two plants here, I think, are super unique, some of my favorites, and they're definitely hidden gems within the conservatory here. They have really cool stories, and in fact, 
they are, the stories are as contrasting as their foliage. So we're going to start with the first one here, which is the Asparagus densiflorus myersii. Now typically this is a solid green plant. However, we're lucky and we have this variegated, this variegated cultivar right here. This plant will actually put out these very tender white fronds. And as it ages, you'll see they slowly start to fade to a very soft green before they've hit this chartreuse color. Now this plant is not easy to find. It would take significant research. You're going to have to find a collector, a specialty nursery. You've got to find the right person to be able to find this plant. Extremely difficult. And it's definitely one of our favorites. It took us years to get it. And in fact, this is years worth of growth to get it just to this size. Now this plant next to me, this is Zamiococcus zamiafolia cultivar Dewan, but the trade name is Raven. And its story is very contrasting of that. But I want to take time a little bit to explain those names, because that was a mouthful. When you hear the cultivar name Dewan, a cultivar name is something that's recognized internationally. So all over the world, if you look for this Zamiococcus Dewan, you would find it. However, that name is not super marketable here in the United States. So what they do is they use trade names. And the trade name for this plant is Raven. And with this obsidian foliage, you can really see how the name hits the mark. So marketing is a huge part of horticulture, and you can see that they really nailed it on the head with this one. So Zamiococcus Raven's story is contrasting from this plant, not only in, in terms of its form, I mean the foliage is beautiful, that stark black, but you also will never find this at a collector's, like a collector gardener, or you'll never find this in a private forum. This plant you're only going to find at your big box stores. And you may ask, like, why, why is that? And in fact, the grower and the producer of the specific plant has signed a contract and a deal with these big box, um, I guess you could say these providers, and they're the only ones that can sell this plant. And so you might get lucky enough to stroll through your local big box store and find this on the shelves. I haven't been super lucky yet. I've seen it only once. But it's really kind of interesting how two super unique, super contrasting plants you know, have this contrasting story too. You can see how hard one can be to find or how readily available. And it's really funny how markets may drive something like that. And I want to point out something about the East Conservatory in general as well. If you actually take the time to notice, the pots here are very unique as well. And every space in the East Conservatory has a unique color combination of pots assigned to that space. We're currently standing in the Court of Bamboo. And you'll see that every pot here is black or white. So it's really fun, as I'm talking about these contrasting plants and contrasting foliages, that you can see the white plant with the white feathery foliage in the black pot and the beautiful black foliage in the white pot. We use the containers in the east to highlight unique specimen. So I really invite you, you know, the next time you're here walking around and looking about the garden, take your time. Each one of the plants that we've put in one of these pots is hard to find or is unique or has something that really makes it significant and worthy enough to stand on its own in a pot on one of the pedestals here in the East Conservatory. Anything you want to add, Matt? Yeah, so I guess first off, yes, the one time I saw it at the big box store, I did buy it for myself. <laughs> it is a plant <laughs> that I wanted. And in fact, I was there this last weekend and saw, you know, I went to a number of them and did see one there as well. So they're hard to find, but they are there. And I did see a question, let me just click and see. Yep. What about the plant allows the seller to get exclusivity? Does the plant need to be genetically modified? It's a great question. And the answer is yes, hybridized typically. So for the exclusivity, it has to be a unique cultivar of a plant. So that is Amiococcus, Zamiofolia Dewan. That cultivar is uniquely bred or a, you could say for this one, maybe a black squirt showed up and they isolated it and have been continually replicating that isolated black spore. That is unique genetically to them. Now there is a possibility that a random black sport may show up on another person's plant and they could attempt to do the same thing. That has happened with hydrangea and other plants. Now, the, I, there are plants that are straight species that can get sold under different trade names. Those, they do have exclusivity to the trade name itself. However, if it's a straight species, somebody else could then use the same plant and sell it under a different trade name, and there's no exclusivity to the plant. The name is exclusive, but the plant is not. So with Dewan here, because it is genetically unique, it, there is exclusivity. And what happens is the breeder knew this was gonna be a highly marketable plant. 
They saw this, they knew it was unique. House plants are a big trend right now. So they went to these big box stores and said, I have something that you're going to want. And if you want it and you want to make sure that nobody else has it, we can create a contract right now so that all future plants that we produce exclusively will come only to your stores. So there's some really unique laws and rules around that. And that's why as shocking as it is that such a unique plant would be only available to big box stores, these breeders really are, are smart in their marketing and in their driving of the market. And so they made that unique deal and it has happened with other plants as well. Any other questions? This is now on my list of, of plants to hunt down to. <laughs> they're there, hard to find, but they're there. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to the next one. Yeah. So here in the exhibition hall, there's definitely one plant that deserves recognition. And that would be the beautiful bougainvillea that grows up the walls here on the stage. The conservatory is approaching its 100th birthday this year. And Mr. DuPont planted these plants shortly after opening. So what you're seeing is the oldest plant planted here in the conservatory that has never been moved. The late 90s, we actually redid all the glass in the exhibition hall and orangery. And when we did that, we had to remove all the other bougainvillea from the space. However, the bougainvillea you see here on the stage has been here in the same pits it was planted in originally. So you're stepping in and truly viewing a bit of history because Mr. DuPont himself had to deal with the placing of these plants. So this big, beautiful trunk you see is just a hundred year old vine working its way up the wall. The bougainvillea is definitely a labor of love. What you don't see from the ground looking up are the massive thorns that grow off of each and every branch. And I said vine in the video, but I'm gonna edit that a little bit. It's kind of a, a scrambler. So those vines, the thorns are actually kind of hook shaped. So what happens is it'll shoot up a long new branch. And then as the branch slowly falls onto something that hook kind of catches it in place. And then as that happens, the plant will continue to grow from there. So it can definitely take over large spaces, but it's not a true vine. It's just kind of a really big climber, you could say. Getting a little technical on words there, but it's, I mean, it's a super unique plant and we just couldn't get them out of the pits when they went to do it. We didn't want to damage the beautiful floor. And so those four bougainvillea, I believe there's actually five of them on the stage and they have been there the entire time, even though there was really no heat in the space. So I guess they got very lucky those winters and a little plastic to save them, but we're super, super happy they're still there. Any questions about this one? Again, you're welcome to put it in the chat or just take yourself off of mute. All right, I'm gonna move on. So here in the exit. Okay. So in 1921, Mr. DuPont finished this beautiful crown jewel that is the Orangery and Exhibition Hall in the conservatory complex. Shortly thereafter, the citizens of Chester County wanted to recognize him not only for this incredible feat that is the structure, but also for all that he gave back to the community in the process. So in 1923, two years after this building's completion, they awarded him with a beautiful gift. And that would be the beautiful clock that you see hanging above me here, overlooking the exhibition hall floor. The clock has hung there since 1923 and has been operational ever since. Now, many times when you come to Longwood Gardens, whether it be a tour or another event, we often start those under the clock. And so if you ever hear an, a guest or another staff member tell you to meet under the clock, this is the hidden clock that we're all talking about. Um, uh, Frank, there is not gonna be a transcript, but we are recording this. So we will be able to uh, send this out to everybody after the fact. And a great tool I'll add to that is if there's a certain plant you're curious about, I do believe you can email, I think it's questions at longwoodgardens.org. And more than likely, if you're asking about the exhibition hall or the orangery, the question is going to be bounced back to me. And I can then in turn get you that information. So if there's any plant on this that you're very curious about, we'll, we'll get you the answer to it here in just a week or so max, typically. And you know, when we talk about this clock, I think, you know, when I went to introduce it, people probably thought, oh, there's going to be this large ornate clock. It's not the case. It's actually pretty small and somewhat hidden. And so I like to point it out because 
especially if you're ever talking to a staff member and they tell you, oh, go meet me here or meet me there. It really is kind of a, a meeting place for us as teams as well. So I just wanted to point that out as it's kind of a, an unseen beacon that we all use here amongst the staff to kind of determine where we're gonna catch up because the conservatory is kind of big and you can't just say, meet me in the conservatory. So we always start under the clock. Moving on to the next one. So I am currently standing on one of my absolute favorite places within the conservatory, and that is here on the floor of the exhibition hall. We also hear it called the fern floor here. Now this may be the cause of the number one or the greatest number of questions that we ever receive. And that is, is that water on the floor? Is it meant to be wet? Is, is that intentional? Is it to increase humidity? These are the questions we get all the time. And I'm just gonna kind of knock them all out in one go here. So yes, what you're looking at is water on the floor. This is intentional and it was designed to be flooded. The beautiful marble you see actually is not finished the same as the other marble throughout the conservatory. So when it is dry, it does not have the same sheen that all the other stone does. That was very intentional and it was just for the reason of being flooded. It's not meant to be viewed otherwise. However, if we think of the history of the gardens, Mr. DuPont also loved hosting events and parties. It's really difficult to do so in two inches of water. As such, this floor is actually at a gradual slope. So where I'm standing currently in the middle of the floor is the very most shallow portion of the floor here in the exhibition hall. Now, as you actually go to either side of the exhibition hall, it slowly gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And there are three drains hidden on each side. So should there ever be an event or a party down here, it's as simple as pulling those six plugs and in about an hour to maybe an hour and a half, the entire floor will be completely dry and ready to host any event. And no, the floor isn't wet to increase humidity. As we all know, the Pennsylvania summers are plenty humid. <laughs> we don't really need any help in that regard. So when Mr. DuPont created this beautiful space, it truly was just for the aesthetics. The water created this beautiful vibe that really is very calming in such an elaborate display. It's really nice to have that kind of peaceful moment here. Now, while we're down here, it's definitely worth pointing out the beautiful fountain that's behind me. That lotus fountain was actually a gift to us in 1975 from the Garden Clubs of America. However, I don't want you to believe that that was also a permanent feature. This fountain actually did not exist at all in Mr. DuPont's original plans. As I was saying, he did like to host events and parties. And what's needed at a party? Some great music. This beautiful fountain was originally used as an orchestra pit. So had you been here in the time of Mr. DuPont, more than likely you'd find a small orchestra together performing and entertaining the many guests that Mr. DuPont had here at Longwood Gardens. Yes, the firm floor, oh my goodness. We really do get so many questions about it. And I think there's just something really serene about the water. It's, it's so fun to stand there. And I mean, I'm sure you see this as you, you stroll the gardens yourself. Those first time visitors as they stand there and eagerly wait to watch something drop into the floor. They're just so curious as if there's gonna be a ripple. And honestly, I think it's pretty magical when we do water the baskets that hang over the floor and you lift them up. And if they've just been watered and you get this beautiful drip drop effect and the little ripples spatter across the water. I think it's a really stunning space. And I think the fact that it is so simple in its design really I think makes it stand every bit as strong as the elaborate seasonal beds that surround it. I don't know if anybody has any questions about the floor here. Maybe we're all seasoned enough to where <laughs> you've already asked me these questions more than once. <laughs> All right, we'll keep going. And there's always time at the end to ask any additional questions. So I am currently standing on one of this one. There we go. So we're here in the Acacia Passage to talk about another truly spectacular plant you're going to find here at Longwood for its first time on display. And that's this beautiful fuchsia hanging basket behind me. This is fuchsia porlamenicae. And it actually is years in the making just to get to this process. So as it is with every display at Longwood, there's years worth of work and effort and research that all goes into preparing each and every display. And there's a great story that goes along with this plant. So in 2018, myself and a few coworkers went to the Netherlands 
and that's kind of a hub for plant breeding. And this is where these breeders, once a year, will put on a large festival type thing where they show off all of their new introductions into horticulture, into the market. And so at each and every one of their greenhouses, they'll bring out some of the best specimen they have to offer. And we went to these greenhouses for about five days straight. And it had to be on the third or fourth day of that trip that I noticed this fuchsia. And I think it's super spectacular for the long tubular flowers you see, which makes it unique from any others. So on these trips, when we travel and look for new ideas, I snapped a picture of this plant and knew that it was something I wanted to see at Longwood in the future, though we didn't know exactly how we'd use it. So I brought it back, brought the name, and myself and a few coworkers went to work in sourcing the plant. 2020, we finally were able to get the plant and do a few trial baskets. Here at Longwood, we're constantly trialing new plants because what looked great in the Netherlands might not look so good here in Pennsylvania. So we had four small baskets of this fuchsia pour Laminiki made, very similar to the baskets we usually make in the Orondri, the fuchsia baskets that you see every summer. However, we thought these might behave a little different, so it merited a trial. Last year, these went up in our children's garden and did spectacular. But it truly was a trial, and we thought it was great and merited going on display. So what you see here is three years of work just to get this one specific plant on display on the conservatory. Now, one of the perks of traveling and seeing these plants in person is I was able to recognize the color specifically. A lot of the times when you're ordering from a catalog or something like that, what you see isn't always exactly what you get. The perk of going and seeing these plants in person is I was able to look at the flower, identify the color, and then immediately think what would pair great with this. And myself and my cohort of staff, we looked and we knew that there are beautiful salmon-colored zonal geraniums. These pelargoniums are in all the urns that align the acacia passage as well. So really, every display you see at Longwood Gardens has years worth of effort and research going into providing one spectacular season. And these fuchsia poor Laminiki are no exception. And these are definitely a favorite. And right now, if you come to the conservatory, I think we have at least three or four different, four different varieties of fuchsia on display. And these are still hanging in the acacia passage. And I'd, I'd invite you to really pay attention to that tubular flower. Some of them can get to be three to four inches long. And they're super unique. They don't flower quite as long as the other ones, but just the fact that the flower is so contrasting from all of their fuchsia, we really just thought this was a place to show them off where you know, the Acacia Passage is somewhat of a minimalist display this time of year. So it allows these guys to truly be the star of the show. Oh. So Matt, we do have a question going back to the fern floor. And is the floor over a basement space and is it waterproofed beneath it? So it is not over a basement space. However, it is surrounded by basement space. So those pipes in the floor have to exit somewhere. And so they actually exit out of the side of the floor and underneath it is actually true ground, like true soil. Now the tunnels are an entire different story. And one day when they reopen those tunnel tours, I'd highly encourage anybody go there because like Disney being, you know, the park is on the second floor. It's the same thing with the conservatory. When Mr. DuPont designed it, he wanted no obtrusive utilities disrupting his display. So the heat, the water, the hoses, I'm sure you've all seen us pull out the hoses from the floor, everything is hidden underneath. And so there are full-size tunnels where we can go under. In fact, the East Conservatory, the large pools that are there, there are tunnels that go directly under those pools. And that's in fact where the large pump set. So there are multiple levels of tunnels under the conservatories. Super fascinating. And we can actually get from one into the other without having to walk through the conservatory if we needed to. Great question. All right, we're going to move on. So we're here in the acacia. So behind me, you'll find the silver garden. And it tends to be a guest favorite and staff favorite as well. And there's a really rich story and history to this garden that I think merit additional attention. So Isabel Green actually is the designer of this garden, and it was completed in the late 80s. And she's rather fond of this garden, put a great deal of attention to the detail. So when she designed this space, she designed it to be viewed from a certain aspect in the garden. So you're actually meant to start this garden experience from underneath the olive tree. And what the olive tree does is bring your eye down. 
so that your focus is on the beautiful garden in front of you and not getting caught up in the structure above you. Now as you notice as you look to either side of the pathway, the pathway is meant to represent a riverbed and on the sides you're actually seeing patchwork plantings of low level plant material. You'll see it's patchwork and that's very intentional representing agriculture that you might find in the, the west where you'll see that they're planted in patchworks and different crops are planted right next to one another. We also keep those plants short so you can truly appreciate that patchwork planting as it's displayed in the garden. However, you'll notice that when you hit that halfway point, there's a large rock on the right side. And everything behind it, all of a sudden, looks drastically different. What's supposed to be represented by that point in the garden is that turn in the path represents the increasing of the water speed of the pathway you're walking on. You've now hit the rapids. You've hit the white water. And if you look to the left side, you will see large plants interjecting vertically into the space. This is meant to be dramatic and super intentional. No water that runs fast ever looks smooth and placid. This is not meant to do that. This is meant to be dramatic, and the foliages that contrast one another do just that. Now it's important to note, this is not the succulent garden or the cactus garden. This is truly the silver garden, and that name is very intentional because what we have planted next to each other could be Mediterranean plants, tropical plants, succulents, desert plants. All of these plants coexist in this space and were truly selected for their silver quality in their foliage or their stems. Now, Isabel Green definitely had an attitude and brought some spice to the garden. And if you notice, there's one patch of plant material that does not fit this description. And it's immediately under the large Dracaena Draco tree. And that is a beefsteak plant which has dramatic red foliage, reddish pink foliage that truly stands out and you actually can't see it when you initially view the garden from under the olive tree. It takes walking down and exploring the garden to see this beautiful bright foliage. And it's at this point that you need to stop and pay close attention to the true hidden gem of this garden. If you look near the beefsteak plant, you'll see a very small rock just, just a few feet below it. And if you look closely enough, you'll see the initials IG engraved on the stone. And this is Isabel Green's mark that she left on this garden over 30 years ago. And it really pays homage to this garden, which was the first garden that she designed on the East Coast and her first conservatory garden. She visited recently and is still as in love with this garden as she was when she first installed it. And I think we all enjoy it just as much. Yeah, this garden has so much, there's so much detail that can go into this. In fact, I'll share another little tidbit while we're here, it just crossed my mind. At the very far end, underneath the olive, you'll see there's some large stone that's setting on top of the pathway. Now, those two stones actually came from a, a bank in California as it was being um, demolished. And you'll notice one is sitting down, kind of serves as a bench, and the other is upright in the corner. So that was actually set there by a crane for Isabel Green to stand in the garden space from that end look out amongst the garden and decide where is that stone meant to go and she stood there for a few minutes and looked and pondered and she finally just looked back and said well that's where it's meant to be right where it's at now <laughs> and so the stone never moved from the place where the crane originally set it so a little bit of spunk to that story as well but it's really fun the personality that she brought to the garden i mean it still shows in the design itself and that was the last one right Mark? i believe so, so. Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing our screen and feel free to ask Matt any questions about these clips or anything about uh, the conservatory or East, East End. And while you're all thinking of your great questions, I will let you know we are planning our next garden chat for September and we will be back in the gardens um, with the hopes of being in the water lilies. Um, so stay tuned for dates for that. Do you have Ooh. a favorite plant? Man, that is a <laughs> tough question. I think the problem is if you ask any horticulturist this, there's not just one, but Oh man, that is tough. Right now, I'm, I'm going to tell you my favorite plant that is currently in the garden. That is, it's a season, I'm going to go with a seasonal crop because we change those out. And I think there's one that's really exciting. And right now hanging over the fern floor is a newer cultivar of begonia. 
and it's called begonia, begonia canary wing. Now it has a chartreuse foliage and it's kind of the first angel wing begonia that has that color foliage. And what's gonna happen is it hangs there and gets the light that exists on the exhibition hall floor. It's gonna just glow lighter and lighter and lighter. And so against the backdrop of the, um, the bougainvillea, these are just gonna glow. They're like, it looks like giant lightning bugs, just like illuminating the area. And I really love it against the deep foliage of the tree ferns that are there right now. So I'd have to say that Right now, that's one of my favorites in the garden. It just, oh, it, it takes your breath away. And in fact, it's hanging over the patio of oranges as well. So when you first walk in the doors of the East Conservatory, if you look all the way to the other end, you'll see these same baskets just glowing super bright overhead. So I'm gonna go with my favorite plant in the garden now. And when you see me in the garden again next time, stop me and ask me, because more than likely, <laughs> I won't repeat the same plants. It's just, they're ever evolving. For the containers, um, is there a collection of containers that you all get to choose from for potting new plants? So with the containers, we, we, we can add and take away to the collection as long as they honor the color. So we can add more black or white to the Porta Bamboo if we find more specimen. Now, we don't wanna take up too much square footage on the actual floor, so we try to use the pedestals a lot. But in terms of Containers, we don't want them to be too loud because we want the plant to be the most spectacular. And in fact, another new hidden gem, you actually see the cacao tree that came from the um, West Conservatory from the tropical terrace is now moved to the East. And it stands right as you enter the door to the left side. And we elevated it in the tallest pot we could find so that you could actually appreciate the pods and the fruit. So, you know, that's just another little story. And you'll see the fruit right now, the pods are a beautiful yellow orange. So another hidden gem utilizing the numerous pots we have. The ones you see aren't all that we own. All right, there's a couple questions about the wood cycad. Um, so I think there's one about the, the, the large wood cycad. Um, and then there's one about the ones that recently moved to the east. Can you talk about them? Yes, let me see. So I'll just tell you about the wood cycad first. The wood cycad, I always kind of preface it. And the reason I didn't use it in this story is because I feel like it's talked about some and I didn't want to sell somebody else's thunder. But the wood cycad, I always say is the one plant to where if the conservatory was aflame and we had to save just one, it would be the plant we save. It is the most valuable. Um, there, are, there are no more female wood cycads in existence. And that's actually the problem that makes them so, so valuable and so rare. So the one we had was a gift from the um, Botanic Garden in Durban, South Africa. And it was gifted to us in the 70s, I believe, and was only a few feet tall. Um, so it's grown significantly since being here, but as you, you'll see with most cycads, they're very slow growing. Now you can clone a cycad. And if you actually look at the base of the wood cycad in the East Conservatory, you'll see little tiny pups is what we call them, little tiny small anywhere from a softball to a watermelon sized pup on the base of the plant at the, near the trunk at the soil line. Now you can, to clone these guys, it is not a beautiful, simple process. It's pretty rough. You actually have to take an ax and hack off one of those pups from the parent plant, hoping not to damage the parent, of course. And you then take that pup and keep it in soil, very loose draining, well draining soil and water it half as often as you think you should, and even then water it half as often. So they don't wanna go wet, you'll rot it out until it hardens off and slowly sends out roots. After a number of years, you may see a few roots develop and you might get lucky and see some leaves shoot out the top. Now the leaves can be misleading because it actually could just be reserved energy in the pup itself. So really you don't know if you're successful with propagating one of these pups until seven or eight years at least. And in fact, we have, done that, one of our senior horticulturists, Joyce Rondinella, um, who actually oversaw some of the cycads in the palm house and the palms there, she successfully propagated one of these pups. And there's only like a three to 5% success rate. So we're pretty proud of the one we have. And yeah, we do actually have a propagule, a pup. And now if you enter the East Conservatory, when you walk down that walkway near the green wall, you'll see the large wood cycad on the left. And on the right, you'll see the smaller immature pup. And I'll invite you to kind of pay attention to the foliage and look really closely they look very different from one another. And in terms of the other cycads, um, 
earlier this winter, we knew, you know, with this renovation project that the Palm House would need to be removed so we could, um, you know, prepare for this large project, this um, reimagined Longwood. And we really wanted to make sure that we were very intentional with every plant we saved. And the site has, or by far, some of the plants have been in our collection the longest. So myself and the other manager, we walked around the garden and really looked for intentional spots throughout the East Conservatory because it truly is the only space large enough to house these plants. And we didn't want it to all of a sudden look like they're intrusive and distract from the, I guess, the, the design of the East originally. So we tried to locate places where either it was a more common palm or a common shrub or tree, somewhere where we could place them. They looked seamless with the garden. And in fact, every single cycad that existed in the Palm House was transferred to the East Conservatory. And I think there's 11 or 12 at least that you'll find on display. So if you walk around the East, you'll see a number of new cycads. And yes, every single one of those did come from the Palm House. Thank you. Um, do you have an idea how long the plants that we've featured in this presentation will be on view so people can come see them? Oh goodness, that's a great question. <laughs> Um, I would say the ones that will probably most likely disappear first will be the fuchsia I showed. Fuchsia are very heat sensitive. Those 90 degree weekends we had will probably stress the plant out. Now, if we stay cool like we are today, it might prolong their lives. But I would say they could come down in as little as two or three weeks. We just, it really is so weather dependent. Most of the container plants you saw in the east will be there long term. And so you won't expect those to change. And Hopefully the bougainvillea on the stage never comes down. <laughs> but I would say, you know, as designers in the East Conservatory or the East End of the Conservatory and the Orangery, we try to have enough change where even our most um, frequent visiting members that may come once a day or once a week, we always want to have something new and exciting. So we are doing changes weekly. So we really try to um, provide that excitement. So even our most faithful members have something new to see every week. Right. Are there any last minute questions for Matt? Hi, Marsu here. Hi, Marsu. <laughs> um, it'll be quicker to ask than type. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Matt, with the Bougainvillea, um, the ones on the pillars surrounding Exhibition Hall. Am I correct that they got moved into the east and moved back at some point? Yes. So okay. when that glass project happened in the main and they redid all the glass, okay. the, the main was closed down for two years. So they actually bare root dug every single one of those that are along the exhibition hall sides and planted them into the east. And they were planted there for two years and then dug out again, bare root, and put back into the main. I am not envious of the person that had to do that. Um, the stems can be kind of brittle, actually, as they get that old and woody. However, with that transplant, every single one of the plants survived. And so everything you see in the orange or, or in the exhibition hall is original bougainvillea. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? There's one more. What are some of the typical career paths that horticulturists take to become staff? Yes. Took to become staff? So I would say it is widely variable. Um, I actually was pursuing a career in medicine before I came here and started as an intern here and that completely changed my path. Um, art degrees are very common. In fact, that having that eye for what is aesthetically pleasing is something that we see quite often. So. There are horticulture deg degrees, which I would say are always a very strong start. And horticulture has become very broad. You could be a vegetable gardener. You could be a production person producing all those beautiful moms and poinsettias that pe we all buy every fall and winter. Um, internships are very a very big deal in the horticulture industry. So just getting yourself out there and being exposed to multiple different opportunities is great. And I'd even say we have a great program here. The Professional Horticulture, Horticulturist Program is a great two-year program. It's for people that maybe are going through a career change or even kids just straight out of high school. We see a, a great breadth of you know, interest in that program. 
And the students that come from that program are now spread throughout the country, throughout the world, doing great things. And so I think it's just, just that initial experience. And horticulturists are generally pretty good at taking somebody under their wing. If there's an interest in the career, there are internships, whether here or elsewhere, really looking to help people, like, I guess, cultivate that passion that can exist for horticulture. Hopefully that answers the question to your liking. <laughs> All right. So we want to thank all of our members for being here tonight. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation, Matt. I hope everybody, as you walk through the conservatory, takes an extra close look at all these new gems that you have to talk about um, and show off to your friends that you bring to the gardens. So stay tuned for our next garden chat, as I mentioned in September. Matt, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Of course, yeah, and anytime you see me in the garden, please stop me. We're so passionate about this. We love sharing things. There are a hundred other gems that I didn't share. <laughs> so please, if you see me or any of my cohort of staff here, we're more than happy to engage and discuss, discuss the garden with you. Wonderful. And if you do have any follow-up questions, you're always welcome to email membership at longwoodgardens.org or questions at longwoodgardens.org and that will get to the appropriate person. So have a wonderful rest of your evening and we hope to see you all in the gardens very soon. Thank you.